It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the double stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week, I have part two of my conversation with Stevie Rochelle. In this half, we discuss what happened to Tuff after Grunge hit, the rise of Metal Sludge, and what he's got going on now. So let's jump right back into it. At this point, we were discussing Grunge and his thoughts on the way the music was changing in the early 90s. And I liked a lot of those bands. If you you know go back to an hour ago when we started talking, I said my initial interests were punk, you know, and I liked some really cool obscure bands too. I loved 999. They're one of my favorite bands. And um, when I first heard Nirvana, the first thing I thought of was 999. I thought of my days of being on skate ramps and hearing that even though the guitar tone was kind of clean. The way he played it, it was kind of sloppy and dirty, and just the drums were so really stripped down. It was like, you know, I don't even know if Dave Grohl had a tom-tom in most of those songs, or if he did, he barely hit it. It was just like hi-hat, snare, kick, you know, like two cymbals. It wasn't like all these chinas and all that kind of shit. So, like, I remember hearing it and thinking, wow, this is, this is cool, you know? And to this day, I still like some of those songs. Um people misconstrue when I say, you know, an American hair band, Kurt Cobain is gone, but I'm back wearing leather pants and a backwards hat. You know, at the end of the day, I, I think that, you know, my opinion, that somebody that committed suicide, um, I think it's kind of a chicken shit way to go. And, uh, you know, for somebody that has a child like he did and a brand new child, I think it's even more chicken shit. So, you know, uh, and I'm going to quote Howard Benson again, because I just listened to his uh, interview with the other day. At one point he referenced all the bands and then said something like Kurt Cobain came, Kurt Cobain came along and blew them all away. Meaning if I'm deciphering what he said, blew them all away, meaning the hair bands. Well, I disagree with that because at the end of the day, Kurt Cobain blew himself away. And I'm still here, and so is Joe Day, and so is Butch Walker. And so is Steve Summers from Pretty White Floyd. So not to, uh, you know, not to start a little <laughs> quote for quote war, but, yeah. you know, I don't think there's anything cool, like Paul Stanley said in uh, Decline of Western Civilization, I don't think there's anything cool about Jim Morrison being dead and Amy Winehouse and Kurt Cobain and all the other 27-year-old guys that killed themselves, you know? knowingly or unknowingly, you know, by drugs or drinking or just killing themselves. I mean, I, I've never looked up to that. And, uh, you know, I think it's a shame that a guy like Kurt Cove, uh, uh, the late, uh, Allison chain singer, Lane Staley went out the way he did and left the rest of his band hanging. But I couldn't be more happy to see how they've rebounded in the last five to eight years. And, you know, they've got a, a great brand there and that, that singer does a great job and, represents them well you know so grunge hits well what happens with tough let's go with that first and then get into sludge well tough ended at the end of 95 um we did our atlantic deal we had a, a, a deal uh we did demos for the second record in the beginning of 92 they paid for them put us on salary i think at one point we were getting like six thousand dollars a month for the band which at that point, we were like, this is great, you know? Um, uh, and then then we got dropped. I remember we went and played, uh, we played our demos for Jason Flom and Kevin Williamson at Atlantic Records in the spring of 1992. And we had songs like God Bless This Mess and Dogs We Trust, Rattle My Bones, um, Better Off Dead. And it was very grungish um it, i was gonna say uh you know it actually had maybe a you listen to better off dead it's, it's got a little bit of alice in chains in it or something um but so we went and played them our demos and jason flom had kevin williamson playing a tape if anybody knows the industry they'll know their names had him playing the cassette tape let it play for about 30 seconds heard a verse and course stopped the song and then he said better off dead huh 
And we're like, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's our, it's our dark Alice Cooper, Ozzy, Alice in Chains ballad. He's like, okay, so, uh, so what are we going to do when, uh, you know, kids start killing themselves all over the United States of America? And said, well, Tuff said I'd, I'd be better off dead. So, you know, we're going to have a bunch of lawsuits on us for kids killing themselves. Like, that's not the right way to go. And we're like, well, you know, you're not understanding. You know, we're, you know, he's like, you guys are a pop band, you know? And we're like, wow, well, we want to be heavier, you know, like Skid Row, you know, their, their last record was great. And he's like, hold it. Skid Row's first record sold three, four, five million copies. And then we did this slave to the grind thing and it barely went platinum and, you know, you guys are not a heavy metal band. You guys aren't going heavy or you're not going darker. We want you to write pop songs. And we're in there arguing with Jason Flom, you know, <laughs> who's at that point, you know, the head of A&R for all of Atlantic Records. Um, mind you, the week previous, we wanted to have this meeting because Jason was going to be in uh, Los Angeles from New York. Our manager at the time, Brian Kushner, told us, no, do not have a meeting without me. I need to be there. No, no, no. We're going to do it. We're going to have the meeting. We're going to have the meeting. So we have to rush into this meeting, play them our demos, and within 48 hours of that meeting, we were, we were dropped. We no longer had a record deal. And uh, so, you know, you live, you learn. Uh, we, we, got, we got dropped. And then um, we ended up taking a deal with uh, a label called Grand Slam IRS with a, a guy named Brian McAvoy who had signed us in 93. So about a year after we had done a few more recordings and we basically sold the record that Atlantic records had paid for the demos they had paid for um, and then dropped us. So we took those and we sold them to uh, or signed with them to Brian McAvoy's Grand Slam IRS label. And that was in 93 and um, they had a, a, a clause in the contract that they had to put out the record within 180 days of us turning in the, the finished uh, recordings. And then it went into 1994, little by little, and he, um, he was in, in the process of losing his deal because IRS was going bankrupt or going under or closing doors. And, and so Grand Slam no more, no more had, uh, had no more uh, outlet to distribute their records through and he ended up taking a job somewhere else, meaning Brian McAvoy, I think, went to be an A&R guy at some other label. And so they had to basically give us our masters back. And so they gave us a certain amount of money for those recordings, but then they, the, the 180 days lapsed, and the Grand Slam IRS never put out the record. So the, the recordings reverted back to us, and that was in the spring of 94. And at that point, I was so frustrated, I just said, fuck it. I'm going to form my own label. I'm going to start my own company and it's going to be called RLS because record labels suck, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and I remember George at the time was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, we're, we're going to put out our own record. I'm going to, you know, we're going to get CDs. We're going to get cassettes. We're going to get a UPC barcode. I'm going to get an artist. We're going to get these mastered. Oh, you're crazy. I'm like, no, this is what we're doing, you know? And, um, the alternative meaning for RLS was Rochelle's lyrics and songs. Um, but uh, really, it stood for Record Labels Suck Records. That was the name of my company, which I still have to this day. So, um, so then, uh, you know, I literally got a Music Connection magazine, and I found a CD plant and a tape plant and a mastering company and a graphic artist. And we started making records, you know, uh, and selling them. And I remember we had sold probably... I don't know, four or five, 6,000 copies of Fist First. And um, then I started having labels call me again, like CMC and TNT and uh, right, yeah. all these, you know, I think CMC had put out Warrant and TNT did like a Peter Chris record and the Wild Side record and uh, Moonstone who did Quiet Riot. And so I started taking meetings with all these little companies, but none of them wanted to give me any money, you know? Um, and, uh, so at one point, uh, this company called MMS Mausoleum called me and they said they wanted to buy the rights to the record for twenty-four or $2,500. And I said, $2,500? Really? And the guy's like, yeah, we'll give you 2500 $2, bucks for it. And I said, well, let me tell you something. I sold 400 copies of this last week to Dream Disc Distribution out of Indiana for six bucks a piece. Uh, so they, they cut me a check for $2,400 for 400 of these why would I take a hundred dollars more from you and give you the rights to the record for, you know, the whole world? 
well, you know, you don't understand the big picture, you know, like, you know, we're going to pick you with magazines. And I said, you know, listen, fuck being in magazines. Okay. I've been in a lot of magazines. I don't give a fuck about being in a magazine. <laughs> I want to fucking get paid for my, for my record, you know? Um, so, you know, the negotiations went on and they went low and we went high and eventually I cut a deal and MMS mausoleum paid me $15,000 for those tape, uh, for those recordings. And I negotiated for them to give me 3000 copies of the finished product when they repackaged it, which I looked at it like, well, I sell these over the course of a few to several years at 10 bucks a piece. That's another $30,000, you know? Now, mind you, these are the same recordings that Atlantic records paid for in 1992. And we sold to grand slam IRS in 1993. And then they didn't uh, release them uh, within per the contract, so they reverted back to me. So this was the same recording, um, <laughs> Fantastic. which I had now sold for like the third time, um, and and was selling it as Fist First as my own uh, title. Uh, so you know, as far as the industry can be shitty to you, it can. But at some points, you know, there's ways to win and be smart and take advantage and you know these aren't huge numbers it's not like i've been tired off those things but i i was able to negotiate to the point where we got something out of it so you know fist first became uh reissued as religious six in 1995 uh there was three extra tracks that they paid for us to record in philadelphia which came out great um i mean at least for the time they did you know so we put out that record, and in 1995, it was just, I mean, at this point, it was like the height of all things that were grunge, and then new metal was coming in, you know, Marilyn Manson, and I think Corn uh, had just kind of started to break. I remember I saw Corn here in L.A., and then we were somewhere in the Midwest, I believe it was the Al Rosa Villa, uh, sadly the place where Dimebag died, and I remember we got to the El Rosa Villa in 95 and we were there to do our show. And the, the people were like, wow, you know, Wednesday night was crazy here. I'm like, oh, really? What's there? And like, oh, Corn was here. I was like, oh, I heard of them. I'm like, how'd they do? There was like fucking 1,300 people here. Like, it was crazy. And I'm like, what? And we're playing like on a Saturday night, you know? I'm like, Corn and 1,300 people here? Are you kidding me? They're like, no, it was some sold out. Like, every ticket of this place was going. And I'm thinking, and, you know, meanwhile, we had, like, you know, 140 people at our show or something on the weekend. And, you know, the writing was just on the wall. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was getting shows that we were getting offered for 250 bucks, And at some point, you know, the promoters are, like, trying to cancel the show. And I'm like, listen, you know, just pay us at the door. You know, whatever, whatever you make, I want to sell my merchandise. I was just trying to make one show to the next because... It was just, and so this is the end of 95. It was basically a 10 year run, you know, from the time that I started in Exciter and Tough actually launched in Phoenix, which is where they're originally from. You know, it was, it was a 10 year run and it was just, you know, it was time to turn the page. And so we, we, we called it a day, the end of 95. And then, um, in 96, I turned 30, filed for bankruptcy and then uh, started working at a moving company full time. And then uh, that's where I came up with this idea to do this side project called Cheese Heads with Attitude. And that was a, that was a, you know, a completely different thing from the music that I had been used to doing for 10 years. It was a, like a Green Bay Packers themed Super Bowl shuffle, if you will, like the Chicago Bears had done, you know, 10 years earlier. And, um, that actually became a pretty successful thing, you know, in the Midwest and around Wisconsin. And for a few years, I did a few of those records and I did a, a solo record and just, you know, some various side projects, you know, like, uh, at one point somebody came up to me and it was Joe Leste from Bang Tango and said, do you want to sing on a tribute record? You know, I was like, yeah, you know, how does it, what's it pay? He's like, oh, it's 500 bucks. You know, you can sing a Motley Crue song. And I was like, okay. And he's like, pick one of these. And I was like, I'll do red hot, you know? So I ended up singing red hot. And, you know, then for, for uh, much of the nineties there, it seemed like every other month I was singing a tribute song, you know, a guns and roses and a poison and the cult and turned into the sticks and Ted Nugent and 
just one after another. And, you know, I was getting paid 500 or a thousand bucks and look at all these tributes to, to the bands that were no longer cool, you know? And, um, so in trying to promote some of my projects at one point, I was, uh, I think it was my solo record. I was trying to push to, to some of the magazines and nobody would, nobody would touch it, you know? And that's when I said, this is the summer of 98. And I said, you know what? I need to start something on, on the internet, on these website things. You know, I didn't even really know what they were, you know? And I was like, you know, I want to create something that's going to cater to, to me. I want to promote my stuff and I want to promote the stuff that I think deserves to be promoted. You know, the bands that are out there are still working and trying. And that meant, you know, the Dangerous Toys and Rhino Bucket and Bang Tango and whoever was like still in a van slamming away for 500 bucks a night, you know, with no monitors and a pizza, you know, and I thought, you know, these bands still deserve a little attention. And and the only thing that really did get attention was like, you know, the, the Rock Never Stops tour, which would be like, you know, Poison, Warrant, and Slaughter would get, you know, a blurb and spin or maybe a little mention in one of the magazines. But other than that, I was like, I need to create, you know, an outlet. And um, looking back, you know, we had we had created one of the earliest social networks for, you know, for 80s band fans and, you know, hair band fans of the, of the genre in general, because we had the site with the, you know, the, the forum and the chat rooms and the gossip boards. And, you know, there was just a place where people could go to find out about these groups, you know? And, um, you know, think about it. This was, uh, we launched September 1st, 1998. There was no Twitter, no Instagram, no Facebook, no MySpace, no YouTube, no Vimeo. None of that stuff existed, you know? Uh, there was no digital file sharing at that point. And so, and, and not a lot of people I don't think had you know, computers at that point either. And, and they definitely didn't have cell phones with today's capability. So when we started this little thing where it was like, Hey, you can go to this address on this website. If you have a computer and there's people talking about Molly crew and slaughter and skid row. And, and then, and then we were also going into the depths of it, you know, flip toxic sleaze beans you know, Johnny Crash, you know, Babylon AD, you know, all these really obscure bands that myself and my partner at the time, Sean, were, were all huge fans of, you know? And so simultaneously about that same time, Jerry Miller in Metal Edge had started to list an email directory. Like if you remember, she used to, she used to list the hotline directory, right? And, and, and fan clubs where you could like write to slaughter or you could call the, you know, the tough hotline or you could call, you know, you know, the Motley Crue hotline. Like they, they basically have this little directory. And at one point she started listing emails of actual rock stars, you know, which at that point hardly anybody even really knew how to use those. And we at one point just started emailing people like, Hey, Nikki six, we're metal sludge. <laughs> you want to do our interview? And he did, you know, and Tommy Lee. And, and, and so, you know, we, we started getting these guys to do our interviews and we just came up with different ideas for the site, you know, like, Hey, let's have a, let's have a hair club for men chart. Like let's list guys that are going bald or wearing wigs or extensions. And, you know, so we started adding a little list, you know, and um, then we came up with, uh, you know, the the penis chart like you know girls girls and groupies would talk about bands and guys and slept with and you know he got drunk and peed on me or whatever and we're like oh that's pretty cool let's put that up there you know and so we just started you know putting up all this information and you know rumor and gossip and tales from the road and and it just you know we had no idea what it really was and and what was going to happen but you know eventually it became within a short period, a pretty, um, pretty big draw, you know? I mean, it got to where there's tens of thousands of people per day logging on to see what we had to say, you know? I think one of the big things about it was that nobody knew who it was. 
Now, that's not something you can reverse engineer. You have to start with that plan, obviously. Right. So where did that idea no. come from to not put well, your name on it? It Well, from the beginning. I mean, me and Sean had, you know, spitballed, so to speak, all the plans in advance. We, we didn't just launch one day. We, we kind of had this thing. We were, we were scripting it, blueprinting it for like probably a month or two. And um, I said, I thought, let's do this like the master magician. You know, the guy that would tell all the secrets of how magic tricks were done, but he's wearing the mask and you really, you know, uh, or um, the unknown comic. Remember the guy who used to tell comedy with the paper bag over his face? Right, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, not that, not that it's the same, but, you know, at one point Kiss was like never saw, you know, never seen without their makeup. You know, uh, guys in certain bands that wear like the mask, you know, the wrestlers, so some of them would wear a mask and you'd never really see them without the mask. So we were like, you know, we decided to do it anonymously. And, and the thing is, you know, Sean was my buddy and he knew a lot of people and he hung out with us and toured and went around with us, but he wasn't, you know, per se would be, you know, recognizable like my name, like, Hey, it's Stevie Rochelle from Tufts. That's the guy, you know? So at one point we knew that I couldn't tell all the things I knew, which I obviously knew a lot, especially being here in the, in the thick of it. Um, I, we, we had to do it anonymously. And, and there was also things that I brought to the table, just being here that I was able to not just talk about the bands that went platinum, but we were dropping names and knowledge and, you know, information about guys that were on the Sunset Strip and what bands they played in before that. And plus we had all these old magazines of mine, like from the BAM and the Rock City News era that we would scan and take pictures and go, you know, Mike Inez from Allison Chains used to be in Surefire and played the FM station, you know, as the second slot opening band. And here he is in Spandex, you know, like just that kind of stuff. So we, we had a lot of, we had a lot of information at our hands that we were able to use. And I knew that I couldn't, you know, tell all the secrets of the industry and, you know, as much as we could build people up, we also kicked some dirt in some people's faces. I mean, we absolutely did. Um, I can tell that anybody that's listening to this all these years later, everything that was ever written on Metal Sludge definitely didn't come from me. Not even close. As a matter of fact, I was probably uh, the lesser contributor uh, over the first five years, six years. However, I stand by all of it. You know, um, Sean was a very, very good writer, very creative, very witty, very funny. Um, and you know, he took on the identity of, um, some of the great characters, you know, the bastard boy Floyd and the Ozzy stillborn and, and, um, you know, the way the names were, um, decided was, uh, a story goes back to me being a scientist and we were in, at, uh, New York and we were sitting with a couple of people from our label including Andy Setcher from Titanium who was also the editor of Hip Crater magazine and I remember Andy and me were sitting there and I asked them about somebody that had written a review in Hip Crater and you, you obviously read those magazines going way back yeah? Of course yeah so uh, you know I, I, I mentioned something about a review I don't know I had a question about something and I said you know so is that somebody that works for you or, and he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, Rob, Rob Andrews or whoever the guy's name was. He goes, no, no, he goes, I, I write the magazine. I write the whole magazine. I go, but there's all these different names, you know? He goes, Stevie, he goes, listen, he goes, you want to know how I come up with a name for an article? I said, how? He goes, I open a package from Columbia records and it's a Britney Fox CD and I'm going to review it. I listened to a few songs and I'm watching the baseball game. And at one point I scribbled down some notes about this and that. And, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he writes the review. And as he's watching the baseball game, he takes the first baseman's last name, say it's Pete Rose and say the pitcher uh, is Raleigh fingers from the other team. He goes, Raleigh Rose. Yep. That sounds good. Raleigh Rose wrote the review. That's who wrote the review. Raleigh Rose. And, I, and I, I kind of remembered that, and I thought it was kind of funny. So when I told Sean, I said, we need to come up with a, you know, an identity or an ID, some kind of kitschy little, you know, interesting way to identify ourselves. I said, let's use Andy's 
method. Let's take one rock star's first name and another rock star's last name and create an identity. And so Sean picked Janie from Janie Lane and Bon, as in John Bon Jovi, and then Neil from Vince Neil and became Janie Bon Neil. And then we had, uh, I was Tammy Sex Slaughter, which was Tammy Down and Steve Sex Summers and Mark Slaughter. And then we had like, you know, the list went on. We were just having fun making a Bloss Dockin, you know. <laughs> um, uh, Blackie's Enough, you know, just just having a blast with it, you know. And we had Donna Anderson, which was Donna Dierico and Pamela Anderson from Baywatch. And, you know, it's it's funny. Like, and that was like the girl that did, you know, the groupie form and the penis chart. And, you know. I mean, in the beginning, it was really me and Sean. And then, you know, there was a couple of people that were close to us, including some girl, girls that we knew, some girlfriends that eventually were like, hey, I have a funny idea. Use this. And, and you know, honestly, within a couple of years, there was probably more like 10 or 15 contributors because what we would do is we, you know, we became friends with people online and some of the rock stars themselves became very you know, invested in the site, you know, they thought it was hysterical and witty and, and some of them wanted to add fuel to the fire and talk shit and, you know, mix it up, stir the pot themselves. So sometimes they'd be like, Hey, I have something. How about if you do this or do that? You know? And, um, you know, then we came up with the sludge wire, which is like a news wire of random news. So we'd take like 10 bits of news that were happening from around the industry. And then we'd just put it in an email and send it off to like, 15 people and go, Hey, got any funny comments to make? Here's our 10 news pieces. And so we'd send that off to a whole host of people, you know, uh, and made, uh, they'd send us, you know, a couple one liners back and we'd be like, Oh, that's really funny. Let's use that. That's pretty funny. Let's use that. You know? So then we just started, you know, adding little, little pieces, you know, and, and then it was all edited together by, you know, Janie Bond Neal, you know, the sludge editor. And then, you know, sometimes we'd color code it like the, the pink comments were supposed to be from yeah. Don Anderson. Yeah, or, I remember that. Yeah. So, but. Uh, how did any of those writers knew, know that you were behind it? No. It was no. all kept secret the whole time. Absolutely. It was absolutely, it was absolutely just. Nobody knew. I mean, there was a couple people close to me that were friends of mine that, that did know. I mean, people that were really close, but there was also other people that I knew that were, that were very good acquaintances of mine that I knew very well and had even been in and out of my house and had no idea, you know? And <laughs> it, it became more complicated because, you know, at one point we were selling merchandise that was like, I think one, you know, one Christmas month in December, we did something like $25,000 in merchandise, you know? I mean, it was just like, so, I mean, I, I, I was, you know, I was wholesaling shirts and we were getting, you know, some of these labels, we were distributing some of their products and we had like guys that were picking it up for us that were like, you know, we're sending emails to like, <laughs> to like Cleopatra saying, hey, we got a guy in LA that's going to come and pick up some books from you. We're going to sell them for you. You know how much? Oh, you know, it's, Three thousand dollars. We're like, okay, you, checks in the mail. Let us know when you can come and get them. And like, we'd have some random guy pull up in a truck and be like, "I'm here for a fit sludge pickup," you know. And they wouldn't know the guy from Adam, and they'd be like, "Okay, here you go. They fit the book. You don't give a fuck who it is," you know. So, so at its peak, how popular did it get? Well, I, I want to say, you know, when you say popular, what are you talking about? You're talking about hits a day, or you're talking about money? I'm talking hits a day just in terms of how big the site got because it was massive. You know, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. You have to go by the time frame as well. In 2004, around the six-year anniversary is when I came out as, okay, I, I, can't, I can't play hide-and-go-seek anymore. It's just getting too hard. You know, and me and Sean were, we were at odds with each other about that. Like, I was like, dude... We need to, we need to fucking come on the closet, you know, or whatever you want to call it. He didn't want to, you know. He was just like, oh, I'm over it, you know. He was out here. He started, you know, acting, and he had other music projects, and he was like, I don't, 
dude, I, I, don't, I don't want everyone to know. I just, let's just stop. And I was like, I don't want to stop, you know? So I, I, I want to say on an average, we were getting 30,000 hits a day, you know? So uh, I know that when Dimebag got killed, sadly, I think some of our biggest days were probably about that time because we were one of the few places online um, and probably at the time the biggest because Blabbermouth was already, a, a, was already around, but they weren't nearly as big as we were at that point. Um, but when Dimebag got killed... I got uh, an editor from Time Magazine called me to interview me. And when somebody from Time Magazine called, I was like, wow, you know, I mean, that was, that was a pretty big deal, you know, with, 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 with Daryl getting murdered on stage. But our, our traffic was like, it was double or triple there for like a week. It was like 80,000 or a hundred thousand hits a day, which is just crazy. And it was because we, we had some of the first, you know, reported news that he was, you know, actually killed. So that's not, you know, uh, not a great thing to be, um, have those great numbers for that reason, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But that was, that was probably some of our biggest, biggest days, but you know, it it was, it was in the 20 to 30,000 hits a day, but that was also, you know, before all these other networks, you know, uh, were around and, and, and even sites in general, now there's so many music sites, you know, we still get, you know, several thousand hits a day, but it, it can't be anywhere near what it was, you know, because I mean, there's you, you and I could probably rip off 30 or 40 sites right now. Oh, totally. In, in a yeah. minute. Yeah. You know, which, you know, 10 or 12 or 14 years ago, there was, there was a handful of us. You know? Well, yeah. Cause like you look at melodicrock.com, I think he probably, Andrew probably dates back, to before a similar us. time because he's been around before, forever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like those two sites are like the anti cool news of, of film sites where they predate everybody, but now there's so many that they just can't, you know, you, you can't maintain what you had. No, and the thing is, you know, Blabbermouth is owned by Roadrunner and, you know, the Ultimate Classic Rock and the Loudwires. And some of those are, you know, now big, big companies came in and, you know, bought the rights to them and took them over and have just basically used them as a, as an, you know, an advertisement for their catalog, you know? Um, and you know, it's funny. I, I've got some friends in various camps and there's been some stuff, you know, that's going on with the, with the whole rat thing too. And I remember I, I had some people tell me some, some comments about, you know, the way Blabbermouth might advertise or not advertise, but, you know, display certain content about the rat thing, because I believe rat is still signed to Roadrunner. So, yeah, I think they still own one record. Yeah. So, you know, it's, 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 I mean, but you know, at the same time, Hey, you know, my site's weighted as well. You know I mean? It's like, if I, if I have a chance to put some foam off on the wild side or tough or nitro or veins of Jenna or, cat house or somebody that's in my corner I'm more apt to do it than somebody that's not you know so um, and you know as far as getting press with you know the, the big the big five or the big ten you know if it's if it's Guns and Roses Motley Crue Poison Aerosmith Bon Jovi Skid Row you know those are those are some give me articles which people want to read about that you know and a lot of the other stuff was you know, at one point for Sludge in the heyday was, you know, it was kind of favorites at one point. And, and I, I could tell you that, you know, there was a lot of stuff on Anthrax or certain bands, which I never liked them. Honestly, I was never a fan. You know, Scott at one point had our dick so far in his throat and couldn't fucking breathe. Uh, but, you know, some of the other guys were, were real big fans of Anthrax. And Scott was a big fan of ours and wore our shirt like on MTV and, funny uh a couple of weeks after i came out as the guy i did one of those vh1 talking head things for uh you know like 50 worst rock videos of all time and i ended up being on a set where it was me and chris jericho and scott ian from anthrax and we ended up in a dressing room that was you know about the size of a bathroom 
and he wouldn't even look at me, you know? And there's like four people in there. And at one point, I was like, hey, Scott, how are you? You know, he's like, hey, man. I'm like, I'm Stevie from Tufts. I run the metal flood site. You know, like, it was like, he kind of acted like he didn't even see me. And at one point, I, I wanted to acknowledge him because, like I said, he had been so friendly and so nice to Metal Sludge for years. I mean, the guy was, like, championing us at the highest level. But when it came out that the guy from Tough was behind it, like, he didn't even want to acknowledge I was standing in a, in, you know, sitting on a fucking sofa next to the guy. So, you know, there were some of the guys that contributed at Sludge for, for years that were big fans of certain bands that we did a lot of stuff on that wasn't necessarily my pot of coffee or cup of tea, but you know, we all had our, like I said, our favorites that we kind of slanted and gave a little extra love to. When it was a secret who ran the site, like that was a big drawing point, I think. Now, when you right. came out as the guy, were you surprised at the response? Because I think Scott Ian's response, I think that's not an uncommon one. When people, when the mystery was gone. I think people started staying away a little bit. Is that fair to say? Well, yes and no. Here's what I thought. I honestly thought, here's the thing. You know, there was, it was becoming where there wasn't an option anymore. You know? I mean, uh, it, 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 if it wasn't, if it wasn't going to be told, it was like having to rat myself out because somebody else was going to do it at some point, you know? So instead of going around and going, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, like a jackass, you know, I owned it. So, but I honestly thought, I honestly thought it would be, you know, in the middle. I thought that some people would think it was cool. Some people would hate me. Some people would be mad. Uh, I couldn't have been more wrong. It was like 98.9% were coming up to me. And of course this is in person, but I also got a lot of emails from people that were very supportive that were like, dude, Kevin DeBro, you know, rest his soul. He came up to me, he goes, dude, you gave everybody the biggest kick in the fucking ass, and we all deserved it so much, <laughs> you know? He goes, you, my friend, I want to shake your hand. I want to take you to dinner. Like, oh, he was that's great. So, yeah, he was so cool about it, you know? So a lot of people were. Um, and I could tell you, now, you know, if I'm not there, I'm sure there's been some backstage and some tour bus talk where it got mentioned over the years. And not as much anymore because truth is, Metal Sludge it just isn't as relevant as it used to be, not even close. So a lot of people would just go like, fucking whatever, you know? Um, uh, you know, it's not original members, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure there's some people that, that probably were, were, were like, you know, screw that guy or fuck him. But... I have to say that, you know, the majority of people that I've seen in public, you know, um, way back then in 2006 and seven, and even, you know, a year ago, they're always cool. I mean, I think everybody realizes it's, it's, it's different today. The internet's way different today than it was 10 years ago. You know I mean? Totally. Yeah. And we all realized that, you know, none of us knew what, remember the first time I was, you know, somebody, somebody said, you know, are you on Twitter? I was like, what the fuck is Twitter? You know, no offense, that sounds gay. Like, what the fuck is Twitter? You know, like, oh, I'm tweeting. Like, really? I'm a bird? Like, what? I don't, I, there's a little bird on the logo. Like, why the fuck would I want to be on that? Like, the first time I heard of those things, like, somebody told me, oh, are you on MySpace? It's like your own space. You have your space. So it's called my. I'm like, oh, so you, what are you doing? You put a picture up? And they're like, yeah. And then you can say, like, hey, I'm doing this. And this is my favorite sandwich. And, and some of that stuff I just thought was so ridiculous. But. I think the first time somebody said, hey, go on Metal Fludge, people are talking about sleeve bees and slip toxic. I'm sure that some people were like, thought it was ridiculous, but some people were like, you've got to be kidding. That's amazing. I want to go. <laughs> you know? Well, totally, because it may not have been cool anymore, but there's still going to be a group of people that are still into it, myself included, because I was one of the early ones there. And now you've got the globe to attract your little niche. So all of a sudden that little niche isn't so little anymore. Right, because, you know, like you, we talked about, there's so many places where people can go and read. And, you know, people say to me, oh, it's, it's not the same. And I'm like, well, it can't be the same. It can't be the same forever. It's, you know, it can't be the same for Howard Benson in five years either. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, but like he said, 
you know, wow, he had like a 15 year run of like one record after another that sold millions of copies. You know, uh, Motley Crue is still selling out, you know, big places, but I mean, they haven't had a real hit song since Dr. Feelgood, you know? So, you know, Metallica. I mean, as great as Metallica was in the first two or three records, and then, you know, the triumphant, like, oh my God, we're owning the world with the black record and, you know, 20 million copies. Guns N' Roses, you know, with Axel and DJ and Bumblefoot and whoever else, it, it can't be the same. Like, and even if, you know, the five guys got together and played Guns N' Roses for a couple nights, you know, it's just it's not going to be the same as it was in, you know, the marquee in London in 87. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just not going to be the same. So Metal Sludge in 2015, you know, in its 18th year of existence, cannot be the same, you know, as it was in the first couple of years, you know, but I'm not a quitter. It's still there. It still does updates. We still, you know, we do news and we've had to, you know, adjust things. People are like, how come we don't do 20 questions? It's like, we've done interviews like that with almost 500 guys, you know, and some of them we did the rewind and the three wind and the back for more. And then we called it the five wire. And at one point it's like, you can only ask so many guys, like, how bad of a singer is this guy? Rate him on a scale of one to ten. Like, you know, we already did that, you know? So now it's a place where people can still go and talk about the old days and see some interviews, and we'll occasionally put out some of our top ten rockers that look homeless kind of thing, you know, with Chris Holmes and Zach Wilde and Phil and Selmo on it and you know, some people are going to say, oh, that's stupid. But, you know, some people find the humor in it because we'll still put together some funny one-liners and it's a good thing, you know? And how long do you see it continuing to go? Sludge? Yeah. You know, who knows? I mean, it's 2015, almost over, to think that, you know, it's you know 30 years ago that I was, getting on the stage and playing looks that kill with my friends for the first time. Like if you would have asked me then, like how long be, before you don't play rock and roll or, you know, how long this internet thing, I mean, 20 years, it's, it's going to be 20 years in a couple of years. I mean, it, as long as it makes me some money, I'll do it. You know, I mean, I'm not going to do it if I lose money. I mean, in some of my projects, I've done stuff where, you know, it's not like I make money off every project every day, but I've done enough projects and put out enough records and given enough of myself to this industry that somehow, some way I make money off of all these little things each and every day. You know, I don't have royalty checks like Joe Perry or Steven Tyler, unfortunately, but, you know, I've been in this game long enough that I've figured out a way to, to make some money by, by never selling a platinum record, you know, and you can, but you know, I, I'm not a guy that just says, you know, Hey, if I'm going to be really rich and this is going to be the biggest thing and I'm going to make a fortune off it every day, then I'm going to do it. As soon as it goes by the wayside, then I'm going to quit. Like I said a little while ago, I'm not a quitter. I never quit tough, you know, tough at one point when, you know, when, when, went on hiatus, I should say for five years, but you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm somebody that I'm, I'm, I believe in my, my, my craft, you know, or whatever that is tough or playing with shameless or the cheese heads or the sludge and all the things that I, at one point put some blood, sweat and tears into, I, I continue to do them, you know, and, and they're not at the same level that, you know, tough's not, playing the Santa Monica Civic Center in 89 or anything. It's like, we're, we're not at that level, you know? But, you know, to go play Cat House Live back, you know, a couple months ago with all those bands and that whole, you know, 80s hair festival, and we've done M3 and the Monsters of Rock Cruise and the Rock and Skulls, and, you know, those kind of events are a celebration of what we all once lived like. You know, uh, when I was backstage at M3 a couple of years ago, I'm you know, in, in the, I don't want to say VIP area, it was, but it was like, we're all in there eating, you know, like, you know, it's like, there's Ted and Bruno and Steve from Danger Danger, and there's 
you know, Steve and so and so from Trickster, and then there's, you know, the guys from and there's Jizzy Pearl, and then there's, you know, me and Chase from Tough, and and then there's Loudness, and again, everyone's joking like, which guys are Loudness? You know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, you know, and then you know, then I ran into you know, Steel Panther, which most of us from the West Coast know Russ and Ralph, you know, Michael and Satch, Satchel forever, you know, and we've all been in awe of those guys forever in the tribute bands like the Atomic Punks, and eventually they're metal shop and metal school and to see them reach the success that they have with this project, which they started over 15 years ago. Now I watched them do that on Wednesday night at Paladino's in the Valley in front of 30 people. And it was fucking amazing. Even then to see them reach that level where I see the videos of them on, uh, on YouTube playing Donington in front of 80,000 people and Michael Starr, is owning it. I mean, at the level oh, yeah. of like raw from <laughs> 79, it's like, there's, you know, I, I could not. And I've had tears in my eyes as I hugged him, you know, on a few occasions over the last few years to say, dude, I'm so happy for you because he's older than me. I'm going to be 50 <laughs> or else old as dirt, but he looks great and he sings great and he is very positive and he's an awesome guy, and I couldn't be more stoked for what they, you know, are doing with that because they do it great. And like I said, you know, how much longer can you do it? Sludge, I am sludge. I am tough. I am all these things. So, you know, I guess if I'm dead, those won't happen anymore. But as long as I'm alive, I'm going to somehow still shove all of it down people's throats as many as I can. As we get to the finish line, and I appreciate you being so generous with your time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you came out with as the owner of Sludge, you know it was pretty. There, it seemed like a lot of tension with you and Sean Card, and I think there may have been some lawsuits and shit going on. Uh, mm-hmm. Now that everything is settled, is there any relationship at all? Have you guys kind of made your peace? You know, we haven't talked in a long time, and um, yeah, it was it was pretty ugly there for a couple of years. But, you know, we became, uh, you know, we were very close friends there for many years. You know, um, he is the guy that helped um, produce and edit uh, all the videos for, like, the Fist First Religious Fix era of stuff, uh, High to the Bells and Better Off Dead. And, and um, he also did some of the, uh, the Cheesehead videos, you know, in, in, in the 90s. And so we, we did a bunch of projects together, Tough and Cheeseheads, and Sean was always a video guy. And, um, but he was definitely one of our gang. I mean, he was very funny, <laughs> you know, uh, especially if you got to know him. Um, and, yeah, it, you know, we had, we had a bad ending there, so to speak. And it was, you know, I, I think it was, it was a mutually, you know, it was a kind of a mutual thing. I, mean, I, I pushed the buttons to make it go where it went. And needless to say, you know, I, I have no ill will towards him and I haven't in a long time. I haven't spoken to him. And uh, I can only hope that at one point we'd be able to, um, you know, sit down over dinner or get on the phone or hang out and, and shoot the shit like we did. You know, because it's been, it's been, you know, it's a, it's a solid 10 years now. So, but um, he's actually went on and done some commercials uh, and some some acting, which he he snagged himself a few uh, a few you know legitimate little pieces from what I've seen. But I haven't had any direct contact with him for a while. As we finish up here, that your musical side, what are you up to today? I know you did some managing of acts and whatnot, and you're still performing. But what is on the slate for you now? Uh, I would. I think I saw you're up on the Monsters of Rock as well. But what else you got going on? Well, in 2016, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn 50, which is obviously a big turning point in anybody's life. Um, but I'm gonna put out Stevie Rochelle best stuff, which is kind of a compilation of my first and second records and a couple of a couple of other tracks that I've recorded over the last few years. So I'm putting out a third solo record 
And I'm also the singer uh, in a band from Brazil called Tales from the Porn. Um, and it's all Brazilian guys. It's got a weird name, but it has nothing to do with porn. I think the guitarist actually owned a porn company or something like that. <laughs> but um, it's, it's basically kind of like the Brazilian version of Rat or Dawkins, and I'm the singer. Um, and uh, we've already recorded uh, a handful of songs, which have come out pretty, pretty kick-ass, actually. And I think there's going to be a, an internet digital single probably in a couple months. So it, 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 it's kind of like, I guess Shameless is, you know, a German bass band, which has put out six records, six studio records, that is, and, and a live record. That it, It's been basically, basically myself and Steve Summers that are the two singers in Shameless. And then um, every time that Alex has done a record, um, Alex and Boris BC are the uh, the two main guys in Shameless. It's always been, you know, half the songs are Steve and half are, are, are me. And then John Karabi sings one song or Bill Lewis sings one song or, you know, a variation of 80s guys. And then, you know, guest guitarists, Tracy Guns, Kerry Kelly, Chris Holmes, Gilby Clark, that kind of stuff. And so these guys in Brazil contacted me and said they wanted to do something like Shameless had done, you know, an all Brazilian band, but they wanted an American singer. And so uh, they contacted me earlier in the year, and we came up with a plan, and they were recording in Brazil, and were going to send me tracks, and then I was going to record vocals here, and they wanted to, you know, do a first song and see how it went, and then it was a second and a third and a fourth, and I'm actually going to sing uh, on a fifth song here in a couple weeks. So Tales from the Porn, that'll be coming out in 2016 with me singing on it, and my third solo record, and then Tough will be at... Um, Monsters Rock Cruise, Monsterwood, in October of 2016. We'll be at Rock and Skull, uh, also in October, the end of October 2016, which is going to be in Joliet, Illinois, outside of Chicago this year. They moved it to a bigger place because this last year, it, it kind of reached capacity on the Saturday. There was like 800 people in this place. Did that partner up with Melodic Rock as well? Yes, yes. Actually, right uh Justin Muir uh, from Rock and Skull and Andrew from Melodic Rock Fest are teamed up to do that. And I have a feeling next year is going to do really well because uh, Rock and Skull last year was actually really good. And believe it or not, um, this year was even better. They had 715 people on the Saturday. And um, I don't know that the club could hold more than that. So they moved it to a bigger place. And I think it's going to be... Uh, a good event. There's a couple other events that are, that are going on in 2016, but it's not, it's not confirmed yet. Um, tough. We'll do our typical 20, 30 dates a year. You know, um, usually it's a couple of dates surrounding a weekend event or something that's big like last year, or I should say a couple of months ago, we did uh, the cat house live. And, um, you know, when there's something like that to tie the, you know, a, uh, a weekend or a week's worth of shows around it. It makes sense. Um, and, you know, this year being the 30 year anniversary, we just put out a couple of products, which if anybody Googles eBay, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they'll find the tough put out uh, the glam years, 1985 to 1989. And what it is is all the uh, recordings that feature Jim Gillette. Um, there's six tracks and there's seven tracks from uh, the first two sessions with me. So that's a, a, a CD digipack with a booklet that just came out a few months ago. And then we just put out our first U S vinyl release. Our, our debut on Atlantic was actually released on vinyl in Europe, but not in America. So I put together a special edition piece called Decadation, which has, um, like any vinyl record, two sides, but uh, getting a little creative. It's not side A and B, and it's not side one and two. It's side 1988 and side 1989. And uh, side 1988 is actually our Sound City Studios recording session uh, from the spring of 88, and side 1989 
is our recording session from Sunset Sound, uh, Sunset Sound Factory, which was recorded in the spring of 89. And it comes with, uh, you know, a great two-page insert full of liner notes, flyers, and then um, the cover art is great. It's, it's photos, uh, authentic images from Niels Lozauer, this Lowe's legendary photographer that we did in 1989 with him. So it's a really good looking piece. Very cool. Well, Stevie, thanks yeah. so much for ta taking the time. This is uh, fantastic. Yeah, well, I think we covered a lot, and obviously I'm a hot fucking bag of air, uh, but, you know, <laughs> I, I like to get my point across. And anybody listening, hey, thanks for your support. Support Sludge, metalsludge.tv or .com or metal-sludge.com. They all go to the same site. Um, you can find me on eBay uh, under Tough CDs, T-U-F-F-C-D-S, and if you Google Tough through eBay or Amazon, you'll find a ton of listings. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Stevie Tough, Instagram at Stevie Tough. Um, Metal Sludge is out there under the same, like, at Metal Sludge. And there's ToughCDs.com, RLSRecords.com, and StevieRochelle.com. All go to the same place, but that's currently uh, a little under construction, and the site's being completely revamped, which probably within the next month or so before the holiday hits, it'll be rocking. But there's so many outlets to buy my stuff. BeamandDollRecords.com carries the entire catalog as well. So I ask that people come out and support us. We'll be in Ohio in December. Yeah! Well, I've been up and down, down, down. That was Stevie Rochelle. I hope you guys liked it. Next week, I've got a great discussion with guitarist John Levin from Dawkin. All right, that wraps it up for this week. Remember, for all things Double Stop, check out the doublestop.com. All 83 past episodes are there, as well as links on where you can subscribe on iTunes or SoundCloud so you never miss an episode. And for those on iTunes, please give the show a five-star rating. It really helps the show get seen. That's it for this week. I'm Brian Sword. Thanks for listening. So on with the show! A metal health interest to